Hey listeners, to celebrate the launch of this podcast, we're running a contest. There are many ways to enter. Subscribing to the podcast, leaving reviews, sharing news about it on social media, and you can even do all of them for more chances to win. First prize is a brand new pair of Apple Beats solo headphones, and there are other prizes too. What are you waiting for? For all the details and to enter, go to edinfinitum.com. That's www.ed-infinitum.com. And click on Launch Contest in the upper left corner. Now, enjoy the episode. Hello, and welcome to Ed Infinitum, the podcast that makes school the subject of study. I'm your host, David Nuremberg. This is Season 1, Episode 2. Why is school so boring for so many students? Did you find school boring? If so, you're not alone. The largest national survey to date of high school students' engagement was conducted by the Center for Evaluation and Education Policy at Indiana University about a decade ago, and the results were grim. Out of the over 42,000 students polled across the United States, about half reported being bored at some point every day, and almost 20% reported being bored every single class. Subsequent Gallup polls reveal pretty much the same figures. Depending on what studies you read, school engagement peaks somewhere in third to fifth grade and then steadily plummets until the end of high school. Why is this? I can tell you one reason why it's not. This is not because young people do not like learning. Young people love learning. They're willing to put in all kinds of sustained efforts to learn something new. You can see that when they spend hours practicing a new trick on a skateboard, or watching YouTube videos to teach them new techniques in applying cosmetics, or becoming an expert in a video game, or learning how to use the latest social media app. Love of learning is human nature. So whatever this problem is with students, it's not a problem with wanting to learn. It's a problem with wanting to learn what schools say they need to learn. Before going further to examine possible reasons for this phenomenon, as well as potential solutions, let's first define engagement. Engagement is the set of attitudes, perceptions, and beliefs of students about their work in school. Engagement isn't just about enjoyment, although that's part of it. It's about feeling a sense of purpose and meaning in what you're doing, the kind of stuff that Viktor Frankl wrote about. Frankl was a doctor who credited his survival in a Nazi concentration camp to having a sense of purpose, something to live for that sustained him. Now, obviously, the context in the case of today's American public school students is not as extreme, but engagement is still about possessing that sense of purpose in your learning and associated schoolwork. Engagement is about your attention, your curiosity, your sense of involvement. Student engagement has been consistently linked with academic success at all grade levels, but particularly in the middle and high school years. Education researcher Philip Schlechty broke it down further. According to his model, student engagement can range all the way from really and truly engaged to what he called strategic compliance, giving the appearance of being engaged just so you can cross the right T's and dot the right I's to get good grades, whether or not you actually care about the learning then down to ritual compliance, which is just doing what you're told in order to get by and stay out of trouble, to zoning out, and all the way down eventually to outright rebellion. So how many students at your average school are really, truly engaged by Schlechty's definition? Well, I've yet to find large-scale studies that assess that in particular, but we do have those Gallup polls, some of which included 800,000 to a million students, that consistently find only about half report being engaged at all, on any level. And it's not that teachers aren't aware of this grim state of affairs. A 2014 survey by Education Week, for example, found that only 40% of teachers and administrators believe that most of their students were highly engaged and motivated most of the time. Teachers and administrators from high-poverty schools report much lower levels than those from more affluent schools, Although, personally, as someone who's taught for a very long time in an affluent school district, a lot of that is probably strategic compliance. So what brings about that highest level, true engagement, that Schlechty talked about? Well, we'll answer that question with a question. What is the one thing that students always ask their teachers? I'll give you a moment to take a guess. 
But understand that I've found the same answer to be true all across the United States, at all grade levels, at all types of schools, and even in my work abroad in Japan and in Korea. So what do you think? I'm willing to bet that you said something on the order of, why do we need to know this? Why do we need to learn it? And if the answer they receive is, because it'll be on the quiz next week, or even, no matter how well-intentioned, because you'll use this at some point much later on in life, the result is highly unlikely to be true engagement. Sometimes it reminds me of one of my favorite Simpsons episodes, where Bart's long-suffering teacher, Miss Edna Krabappel, attempts in vain to keep her class engaged with learning Roman numerals. If you don't learn them, she says, you'll never be able to figure out the dates that major motion pictures were copyrighted. The joke is funny because we've all felt that sense of absurdity in a school setting. That question, why are we learning this? What is it ever going to do for us? And that's a question to which teachers owe students an answer. Engagement isn't just about an experience that's fun. Students need to feel that that experience has something to do with them, that it connects somehow with what they find relevant and valuable right now. In that first engagement poll that I mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, among the top reasons, 42%, that students reported for considering dropping out was, I didn't see the value in the work I was being asked to do. So how can schools and teachers help students see that value? One way is by helping them make a connection with their choice of topics and applications to what students already know, care about, and find interesting. Take, for example, Fortnite. Now, teachers need to do more than just write word problems referencing it. So-and-so from Fortnite has 10 apples. If he eats three apples, or blows them up, how many will he have left? Students see through that kind of pandering pretty easily, and why wouldn't they? True connection between what students are expected to learn in school and what they care about will involve contextualizing that school material within and applying it to those things that students like and already find meaning in. So maybe learning the geometry of angles or some concept from physics by studying the movement of the characters and weapons fire in Fortnite, evaluating how the game works this, maybe versus how objects behave in the real world. Connections don't have to be direct application either. Analogies and parallels are the bread and butter of engagement. Help students connect the Montagues and the Capulets feud in Romeo and Juliet with the rivalry between cliques at their own school, and you have a fighting chance, no pun intended at helping students both understand what's going on in the play and care about it. But what if teachers have a topic or a learning goal for which they can't find a connection by any real stretch? Well, they can still try and tie that lesson to universal themes. In the education world, we draw a distinction between themes and topics. I'll give you some examples of each, and maybe you can tell me what the distinction is between them. Here are some typical topics that you might find taught in middle or high school. Ancient Rome, Symbols and Literature, Taxonomy of Organisms, Single Variable Equations. Now, here are some themes. Power, Continuity, Rise and Fall, Appearance versus Underlying Reality, Possibility versus Limits, Inclusion and Exclusion, Belonging, Known versus Unknown, The Present, The Past, and The Future. I hope you can see that topics, those particular discrete subjects for exploration, may or may not interest students on the face of it. But themes, those universal human ideas that can encompass many topics, students are interested in those. How do I know? Because all human beings are interested in those. So ancient Rome, might not immediately fire a student's engagement batteries, but do they care about power in their own lives? You betcha. Symbols in literature can appear opaque and irrelevant, but students care about appearance versus underlying reality. Why else would they make Finstagram accounts? Taxonomy of organisms? Well, that can be pretty obtuse until you make it about exclusion and exclusion. The idea of who gets to be in what group and who makes that call. And even a math phobe might take another look at single variable equations 
if it's contextualized in a larger conversation about known versus unknown and how we go about trying to find the truth. Again, this has to be done in a way that isn't just slapped on, but is some integrated part of a larger and more sustained exploration that begins and ends in the new subject matter, but along the way goes through all kinds of places that students find immediately meaningful and relevant. Good teaching involves making a bridge. This thing that you don't know or aren't familiar with or maybe even find off-putting, well, it's connected to this thing that you do know and that you do like and that you do find meaningful. So that's one thing. For another, in order to be engaging, learning has to be active. Students actually need to do as opposed to just being told. How did you learn to drive a car after all? From that little booklet the RMV gave you? No, you learn from getting behind the wheel and actually operationalizing and enacting those principles of driving on an actual road with actual cars. That's what an effective driver's ed course does. Tech and voc schools don't just teach principles of carpentry or electric work. They have kids build things and test them out. Yet somehow, for reasons we'll explore in other episodes, Mainstream schools too often operate under this false dichotomy that privileges abstract learning over practical application, which is probably the most anti-academic thing I can think of insofar as how it hinders learning. Basically, reading a book about some guy who talked about all these principles in the abstract somehow marks you as more educated and valuable to society than someone whose education came by the actions of her hands and the sweat of her brow. It's a false dichotomy. You need both in order to truly and thoroughly learn something new. And unfortunately, our presently polarized society thrives on dichotomies. This is part of what lies at the heart of conservative politicians and media accusations that coastal elites are just a bunch of snobs who don't understand how real working Americans live their daily reality. In recent years, it's led to a suspicion, distrust, and disregarding of experts in all areas of learning, which I don't think has had terrifically good effects for our country. But some of this really is the fault of how we teach in our schools. If we teach science through reading textbooks rather than through the actual process of experimentation and testing hypotheses, then we shouldn't wonder why kids are disengaged with it, and we also shouldn't wonder why we have this debate between evolution and intelligent design. If students were to actually, for example, breed fruit flies for certain traits and watch how those traits change across a population in response to those environmental pressures, instead of just reading a summary of Darwin as their nightly homework, then we might have a different situation than the one we have now, where some people see this whole affair as, well, your book, Evolution textbook says this, and my book, religious textbook, says that, so it's all just a matter of what you believe, right? Now, I'm not saying anything like learning through textbooks is a bad thing. It's just incomplete, and the consequences of that incomplete educational experience can be literally earth-shaking. Think about climate change. A population that actually carried out experiments, like shine a heat lamp on soil in Alka-Seltzer in a bottle, and watch how more carbon in a closed system raises the temperature, then people could test these principles for themselves and not just rely on what either Fox News or MSNBC tells them. I'm convinced that learning through doing isn't just engaging for students. It also just might be the cure for our so-called post-truth society. If everyone has access to answers they can find for themselves, then they're going to be a lot less dependent on that fake news site their crazy Uncle Fred shares with them on social media. Now, to be fair to our schools with their ever-shrinking budgets, it's not as if every school can purchase its own large hadron collider in order for students to learn about the behavior of subatomic particles. But there is a lot more that schools can be doing, not just in the sciences, but all throughout the curriculum, to give students opportunities to learn through actual hands-on experience. So that's what the research supports, that learning through doing and learning through connections and analogies to their own lives and the things they care about constitutes the recipe for students who are genuinely engaged with their schoolwork. So engaged that they might even be willing to grind through stuff they might not always enjoy 
if it means in the big picture it's connecting to something they find meaningful. How do we know that? Because remember, kids do it all the time. They're willing to go through the boring work of practicing combo moves on their controllers over and over again in a fighting game, or memorizing all the lyrics to a favorite song, or all the stats of their favorite athletes. It's not the process of doing difficult or boring tasks that is inherently disengaging. Rather, it's doing difficult and boring tasks for no discernible reason, or no reason that you care about. I have a devil of a time convincing some teachers of this. Some see it as pandering or coddling. Some are satisfied enough with compliance sans engagement. And I can empathize. Teachers, especially new teachers, want a classroom that's predictable and easy to control. But engagement is hugely correlated with achievement, with learning beyond just strategically for that test or paper. And any good teacher needs to be able to help students learn in that way. Now, some teachers themselves don't see the point of why they're teaching this particular piece of material, other than that they're told to, or that's just what you learn in an English class or a math class. So every teacher should proceed from a position of, when do you use this in life? And then, to the extent that's possible, actually have the students practice doing it. If they're learning geometry, have them actually build something using those skills they've learned. If they're learning the principles of writing a persuasive essay, have them write actual letters to the editor that you mail off. If they're learning about the structure of the US government, have them lobby a local government official about an issue they care about. The shape of your classroom needs to be different for this sort of learning to take place. Instead of one teacher addressing students in rows of desks, students need to be up and about, working cooperatively with one another trying out experiments, building things, and importantly, able to make mistakes that they learn from and can come back from without it hurting their grade. Future episodes of this podcast will delve further into how a teacher can go about setting up the conditions for and managing this sort of classroom. But for now, let me just assure you, it is possible. However, it is not easy. It's a lot more work than just photocopying a daily worksheet or giving a lecture. And I do know how overburdened the average teacher is. I've been there. I've probably been there within the last week. But teaching in this way is actually teaching, as opposed to just standing in front of a room going through the motions of a lesson. And kids, in turn, if you're doing it right, and if the phase of the moon is in your favor, will actually be learning, as opposed to just strategically complying, or not even doing that much, as the case may be. So, yes, students of America, school may be boring, but it doesn't have to be. That's all the time we have for now. Class dismissed, and we'll see you next time. I hope you enjoy listening to this podcast. If you liked this episode, please write us a review on iTunes and like us on our Facebook page. If you really liked this podcast, please consider visiting our website, www.ed-infinitum.com and making a donation to keep it running. Otherwise, in the grand tradition of underfunded public schools, we'll be reliant on only what we can make from bake sales. The website is the place to go if you want to suggest a topic or send me an email for any other reason. Our theme music is Happy Schoolmaster by Mind Music ID. Thanks again for listening, and remember, every day brings us opportunities to learn something new. Still with us? Awesome, you get a treat! This week's intriguing education fact. The distinction of being the world's smallest school, according to the British Daily Mail newspaper, goes to Turin, Italy. At least as of 2014, the elementary school in the small town of Alpet has just one student, taught by just one teacher. You really can't ask for a better student-teacher ratio than that, although the student does admit she gets lonely sometimes. Bye!